Hi, and welcome to another edition of Civically Speaking. I'm Alicia Crank, the Executive Director of Seattle City Club, and this is our new podcast. And I am so happy to be able to kick off number four with Senator Monka Dingra. Hi, Monka, how are you? I am doing so well. Uh, it is such an honor and a privilege to be here and to have this conversation. Thank you for inviting me. Well, you know, I've wanted to talk to you one-on-one -on -one for a while, especially when we have our legislative previews every year, but there's always so many people and so many constituents to talk to. So like, now I get you. So um, thanks so much for carving out time. I know between coming out of this session and running into other things now, um, I'm sure your time is super limited. So we appreciate that. So let's talk about the session. So if I heard correctly, you had 12 bills passed through this short session. If that is true, confirm it and then talk about that a little bit. Thank you. Yes, it is true. We had a 60 day short session and I think most people average about three or four bills. And I did have uh, 12 bills passed the session. And I'll just okay. say, you know, none of them are like the license plate bill or some of the easy ones. Uh, every single one of these bills was extremely meaningful and really was impacting survivors of um, gender-based violence, our children, mm -hmm. mental health, gun violence. Um, so I was really, really proud to do this work and deliver just amazing results. I'll also say that every single bill was bipartisan. So yeah. I have a 100% uh, record of 12 bills being passed that uh, have strong bipartisan support. Well, you know what? That actually leads into one of the questions I was debating if I was going to ask, but now I'm going to do it. Just because I think bipartisanship is so important. And of course, that comes with civil discourse and some people not so civil. Um, some of the feedback I've gotten, especially from some of those that are coming into our newly formed youth council, is why does everything seem like it has to be partisan? Why? And and the one question that came up around that was around the, the child marriage. Yeah. It's like all but one person. It's like, how can this even be something that someone could vote against? So I guess to 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 ask pose that question to you, does it seem like everything has to be? you know, D versus R, and there's just some things that can just be universally yes. Absolutely. And I will, you know, this is a statistic I quote all the time that actually 95% of the bills in Olympia are bipartisan. In this Washington, there is a lot of collaboration. 5% mm. are not, but 95% are, which is a huge number. I was very disappointed that the child marriage bill, eliminating child marriage in the yeah. state of Washington, wasn't unanimous off the floor. I actually had to uh, debate on the floor whether or not there should be a judicial exemption where a judge can allow children under the age of 18 to get married. And I fought against that because, um, we, you know, the, the circumstances are so challenging that you cannot have a young girl stand up for herself and say no when the family wants the marriage um, and go to a judge to allow it. So I was very, very clear that when you ban child marriage in Washington, we ban ch child marriage in Washington period. We right. did have one Republican legislator who voted against it, much to everyone's surprise. We actually mm -hmm. had a few who voted no, and then they changed their mind to yes. Other than the one, um, it it took everyone by surprise. But, um, you know, there was people entitled to their opinion. Yeah. But that was unfortunate. So why do you think, coming off of what you're saying, right, you know, 95% of it is bipartisan, why do you think that 5% seems to get the most attention? Because, yeah. you know, I was surprised a little bit when you said that. And I think most people, when they would initially hear that, go, really? But then if that's the case, why is it, I mean, is it a mainstream media thing? Is it, what do you think is happening that it feels like the, that 5%, if you will, is what eats up most of the airtime? You know, I think it is the media. Uh, it's a lot more exciting to talk about a fight or disagreement. Um, I think our media thinks it's boring to say, yes, 95% of the, you know, 95% of the bills they agree on, or there's great collaboration. And I use that statistic all the time because I think it's important for people to understand that we actually get along. Um, you know, we have, I am an extremely progressive individual. 
we have our Republicans who are part of the Freedom Caucus, which is extremely right wing. And I can tell you that on so many of my bills, I have members who will speak up and say wonderful things about me, which makes me think that maybe they're going to vote for my bill, but they vote no. But they still have a lot of respect for my work, my work ethic, and uh, what I put into a bill. And to me, that is extremely meaningful because you can disagree about policy. You can disagree about, um, you know, fundamental values when it comes to abortion, gun rights, but you can be civil and have relationships that are based in respect. And I feel that is what I have in um, the legislature. Um, and I'm really proud to have that reputation as being someone who will work collaboratively with anyone on any issue, but really making sure I stand firm to the values and to the solution, but really making sure that um, I sit down with every single person who's a stakeholder and make sure that they have been heard. Yeah. And so when I think about, you know, this podcast with Civically Speaking, one of my my triggers, if you will, in even putting this together was thinking about those behind us, right? The, the young people, the young adults that are not only getting ready to be voters, are contributing members, you know, of society and our economy. But, you know, they're also looking at how we treat each other. And they're coming into what does civic engagement and what does politics look like? And I feel that there's a lot of feedback coming in around, you know, it's so disruptive. And there are some that just kind of want to stay away. But I think there's others that are more leaning into how can we change this? So I was really um, impressed but as well as, you know, grateful that some of the bills that you worked on kind of had that youth angle to it, because I think that that is something that we, as the older folks now, really need to start looking at is those that are coming up from behind us and getting ready to take our spots, to be honest. What are, what are we modeling um, as far as how we behave and even the bills that we're putting forth to be able to make hopefully a better tomorrow? Absolutely, Alicia. And I'll say, you know, uh, when I first got into politics in 2017, my kids were in middle school and I was someone who was very involved with our youth. I ran um, uh, passport club, chess club, math club. I was actually the coach of my daughter's destination imagination team. And so ah, when, I decided, yeah. Yeah, when I decided to run for office, a lot of these young kids that I knew uh, first was surprised, right? Because I don't come from a political background. And then the next question was, how can we help? So I had a teen campaign committee in 2017 for the special election, and then in 2018 for my general election. And um, every single year in the legislature, I have actually sponsored bills that have been brought to me by the youth in my district. And even mm -hmm. as I run for AG, we have our youth um, committee. Because when we say um, they are our future, they are our future. And mm -hmm. we have to engage them and we have to listen to them. Um, and, you know, anytime when I've engaged with them, they have so greatly appreciated having that space where they can get involved. And for them to see campaign world up close, see the legislative process up close, it is life changing. I have seen so many of them actually uh, make a different decision on what they want to do in their life based on this experience. So I'm so grateful that you mentioned that because that is a huge part of what I always want to do, no matter um, what position I'm in, is always engaging the youth. And so and I, and I like hearing about, you know, the youth initiatives that's happening in the legislature. And, you know, when we were building this civically engaged youth council, you know, I said, I want to build this backwards. Meaning that I think I remember being a young whatever and trying to plug in to the political establishments, the, the clubs or whatever, and not feeling like fully engaged because they were telling me what I should do as opposed to asking me what it is that I want to do. And so when we're building up this one and you actually know one of our leadership team leader, um, leader Shirag, you know, he's a perfect example of that because he started something called Civic Champions and about this, you know, PCO initiative and actually did this um, podcast with him a couple of ones ago for him to talk more about that. But how do you receive information like this when young people are reaching out to you? 
You know, I think the first thing is you have to go with an open mind. Um, the youth, when they are excited about their ideas and they have plans, they truly are coming at it from an attitude of what we can accomplish. They're not thinking about where are the pitfalls and why can I not be successful? They really are focused on why they can be successful. So every time I come to any of these meetings, I'm coming with an open mind that says, yes, I'm listening to you. And I'm not listening with the intention of saying no. I'm mm -hmm. listening with the intention of saying, how can I help you um, on, on your mission and on your journey? Um, how can I be a partner? And so I think it is really understanding my role is not the adult who says no, but my mm -hmm. role is really to try to understand what are they trying to accomplish? Why are they trying to accomplish? And how we can get them to be successful. So I can give you a couple of examples. You know, the, the reason why now in the state of Washington, we do not pay a sales tax on menstrual products is because of teens in my district. That was a bill that um, they wanted to sponsor that we did. Yeah, I remember that one, yeah. We now, every school and um, high school, colleges, um, have menstrual products in the bathrooms for free. Again, mm -hmm. teens in my district who fought for that and got that done. Uh, next week, the governor will be signing a bill that requires bleed kits to be in every yeah. school. And I got to say, this one was really fascinating to me um, because I actually hadn't really heard about the bleed kits, but mm -hmm. they had been popular, especially with um, after all the shootings. And actually, a person can bleed out before our ambulances can even get to them. And so it's really wow. important to have these. And they're very, very um, inexpensive and easy to administer. And then I get a call from our National Trauma Surgeons Associations that reached out and said, we love this bill, Senator Tingra, how can we partner with you? Mm -hmm. So I had these hearings in the Senate where we had this youth, the youth voice come in and testify, followed by trauma surgeons. Wow. And that collaboration to me is amazing. At the bill signing next week, I, I, you know, we're going to have the trauma surgeons and the youth <laughs> together. And to me, you know, that is what happens when you listen to the youth you can really accomplish things that we that may not be on our radar. And I can tell you, a lot of these teens and this youth, they're going to seriously start thinking about going into medicine because yes. of this experience and the interactions they've had. So I think it's very important we show up in the space, mm -hmm. to be allies, and not to bring the adult voice of no. Right. No, that's... Thank you for sharing that example, because I had no idea that when I saw that bill come across. That's like a bleed kit. It was not what I initially thought as a woman, but then I was like, oh, and I would have never thought of something like that. So yep. cool beans. All right. Let's talk about um, three specific bills um, that you were able to work on. I want to talk about the first one that you partnered with Representative Cortez on, because I think, again, we talk about um, behavioral health, especially when it comes to young people. You know, I think especially coming out of COVID, too, there were some things that were unrealized and things we tried to plan for, but you can't plan for something you're not used to. Um, and seeing that the impact of that, and you know, the month of May is, you know, Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're actually going to be doing some programming around that, um, that awareness month in the month of May. But how did you end up working with Representative Cortez on this? So I'll just say, um, I have done, I've spent decades working on mental health. Um, as a King County prosecutor, um, you know, we were the second in the country to start a mental health court. And I actually created the therapeutic alternative unit at the King County Prosecutor's Office. We were the first such unit in the country. Um, and so I've done a lot of work in mental health mental health field. I was on the board of NAMI Eastside, that's National Alliance on Mental Illness yes. Eastside. Um, for over a decade, and in the legislature, um, you know, I'm one of one of the leads when it comes to access to mental health and substance use disorder. So the advocates um, have been talking about, you know, where are the holes in our system? And so the advocates had reached out, um, and they really wanted to make sure I had the companion to this bill because of the work that I've done in 988 and a crisis system, and then really making sure we're removing barriers to um, to getting people into substance use disorder program, but you always think, okay, they go for treatment and then what? Right. For children, that is a much bigger barrier because we don't have a lot of options. 
to inpatient treatment, then what? And so that's where this bill came about. And I was um, happy to just support Representative Cortez's bill, but they really wanted me to drop a companion because they're like, just in case something goes yeah. down. And so that's how I uh, dropped the companion. And I told Rep Cortez, it's his bill. This is just a, you know, just to make sure we have another vehicle if needed. But it really is about making sure we're taking a look at that entire spectrum of access to services in our mental health and substance use disorder field and making sure we have a strategy for every step of the way. And this is one of those strategies and makes sure we close um, a, a loop a hole on here. So that ties into your bill 5853. That's right. 5853 uh, is a bill that uh, creates a crisis relief center for our youth. So um, when Rep uh, Orwell and I worked on the 988 bill and creating a 988 crisis system in the state of Washington, we really wanted that bill to be, to be a system that each and every one of us would want our loved ones to go through. And so we really took that opportunity to create um, the best system we could. And, you know, while Washington is known for a lot of things around the country, access to mental health isn't one of them. But I will mm -hmm. say that when Rep Orwell and I finished this bill and it got passed, Mental Health America called us and said we were getting a national award because wow. our 988 bill is now the national model. And so part of that was taking a look at what other states are doing that they may be doing better than us. And so one of these things was actually in Arizona, but they have these crisis centers where law enforcement can take someone and literally the people open the door, say, thank you, welcome the person in and shut the door. It's called um, basically a no barrier access. Mm -hmm. And it's really important to have one of those. And it's a model we don't have in Washington, because in Washington, we actually require people to be medically cleared, uh, mm -hmm. which means what? They have to go to an ER before they can be brought to these uh, centers. They have to have all these other criteria before they're accepted into any of the programs we currently have. And so as a result, people end up in our emergency rooms or they end up in our jails. And so that's what this crisis system does. It is a no barrier um, uh, place, which is only for 23 hours, because we don't this mm -hmm. to be a warehouse where, where people or children go. Mm -hmm. And for our children, um, we have to find a better name for it, but they call it like the Starbucks model, where it's a very mm -hmm. welcoming place where kids can actually de-escalate. They can kind of really get the time they need to um, have their needs and services met in a very uh, therapeutic way. And then really making sure they have a plan and what they do after the 23 hours is done. And so yeah. that's what this is. And again, it really helps with that temporary need that people have. So you're not taking our kids to emergency rooms or to jails, but really providing this third option for de-escalation and crisis intervention. Yeah. So now you're done with legislative session. You're going to do some bill signing later, but obviously you're also running for office again. So you know, this is a really interesting, you know, election year in Washington state because you have two of the largest offices with no incumbent, you know, so I think it's going to make for an interesting primary and especially an interesting general. So you are running for attorney general. And so my question for you, as I'm asking anyone else that is running for any particular office, why you and why now? That is such a great question. Um, you know, what a lot of people actually don't know is that I got my legal um, start at the Attorney General's office. Yeah. When I was in law school, I actually interned at the Attorney General's office working in the sexually violent predator unit. And I did that for two years. And then when I graduated, I had the option of either going to the prosecutor's office or staying at the AG's office. And my then supervisor actually told me, Go to the prosecutor's office. You're going to get amazing experience. And anytime you want to come back, come back. So I will say the AG's office is something where I do have deep connections and roots. And I know a lot of people who work there. It's an office that um, I am personally invested in. And the reason why, um, you know, I decided to run for office in 2017 because Trump had been elected. Mm -hmm. And especially people who look like me, a immigrant, woman of color, it was really important that I step up and run for office because it was critical that I represent communities that don't see themselves reflected in government. 
And I really wanted to make sure that we were doing everything possible to protect Washington from what was coming at us from the White House. And I have been so proud to have played a pivotal role in the last seven years on so many of the policies that we care about, access to voting rights, access to reproductive rights, gender affirming care, protecting our environment, protecting survivors of violence. And so, um, you know, when Bob Ferguson, with Bob Ferguson running for governor, this seems like a very, very natural next step for me. Uh, I am someone who will be ready to go on day one. I'm really hopeful we don't have Trump in the White House in November, but if that is the case, I have been doing that work protecting Washingtonians from Trump since 2017. I have incredible relationships with Bob Ferguson, who I'm guessing will be our governor. I have great relationships with our legislatures, and I have intimate knowledge of the AG's office. And I think that combination is going to have us ready to go on day one. And so I think this is important uh, for me. I have a track record of working on really tough issues and delivering results. And I've been an agent of change my entire life. You know, creating a therapeutic alternative unit at the prosecutor's office is not what is traditionally done, right? When I went to the Senate, I doubled the women of color from one to two. Um, and I can tell you the culture of changes that have happened in the way the Senate is run, the internal workings, the collaboration and the stakeholdering is different. And so that is what I bring to the Attorney General's office because we have to make sure government works for the people. I think the expectations that Washingtonians have on how the government shows up for them has changed over the years. And we need every level of government to respond to that. And so to me, it is about making sure that the AG's office is actually going out into the communities and doing education and outreach and explaining to them what their rights are and the role that the Attorney General's office can play in protecting them. I'll say the only reason people know about the AG's office is because of Bob Ferguson. Prior to him, if you asked anyone, what does the AG do? I don't know how many people would be able to answer it. So I would love to build on the great work he has done and really bring that collaboration from the people to government in this role. Okay. Well, I'm gonna let you have the last word because I'm so happy that you, again, able to take time out to, to have this conversation with me and being able to learn more about some of the bills that you worked on and kind of what their connective tissue were, especially we're around youth and mental health. So thank you so much for pointing that out. I have your um, election website information up if anybody wants to reach out to you. So I will say any final words you want to leave for people to know more about who you are or, or what it is that you stand for that might not come through um, during kind of the more hardcore, you know, interviews or Q&A. Thank you so much, first of all, for this conversation and giving me uh, the space to talk about this. I normally don't talk a lot about myself, so I will actually share a personal story. Um, what a lot of people don't know is that I was actually born in Bhopal, India. Mm -hmm. And Bhopal is the site of the Union Carbide gas tragedy. And my father actually worked for Union Carbide. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night so many times because my father had to rush out of the house because there were problems at the plant. And he ended up resigning from that job because they wouldn't take his complaints seriously. And at the age of 40, he actually died of colon cancer. There was no history of cancer uh, in his family. And my mother, who was a young widow at the age of 33, decided to move to this country with uh, my brother, who was 11, and me, who was 13, to, you know, build a, build a life for all of us. And so, you know, when I sit here talking to you, talking about the attorney general's race, talking about being a senator, it is just so surreal for me that someone with my background, with my experiences, is actually in a position where I can be a voice for people who haven't traditionally had a voice. And so what I will say is that every position I've ever held, I lead with my values because I think there's more we have in common than what sets us apart. And for me, building connections um, to community is critical. Being compassion, compassionate is very, very critical. Being responsible, being honest and having integrity. Um, that is how I show up to do the work that I do. And I'm always honored that when uh, people look at me and they think of the reputation I have, that those are the things that they think about. So I really do appreciate you giving me this opportunity uh, to talk about myself. 
<laughs> well, thank you, Senator, and thank you everyone that's watching. And I'm looking forward to the next Civically Speaking conversation I have. And again, I'm inviting everyone to come to our April 3rd Civic Cocktail at the, at the Collective Seattle. It's all youth focused. Bring the kids, bring your legislators, because these young folks have something to tell us and we need to listen. So thank you and see you again soon. Thank you so much.